Welcome back. Nearly three years ago, an award-winning W-5 investigation helped convince the B.C. government to launch an inquiry into money laundering in that province. Well, that inquiry has now heard all of its testimony and is about to provide recommendations. Kevin Newman updates the evidence of widespread criminality heard at the commission and how life has changed for the man who blew the whistle. There is usually no more beautiful natural setting for a city in Canada. There's just so much for the eye to see. Hidden from view in a few places is a much more sinister landscape. Dark scenes of stacked bundles of 20s from the drug trade, high rolling gamblers, and transnational crime figures never brought to justice. Are you able to see me? Yes, Mr. Commissioner, we can see and hear you. For almost as long as the pandemic forced us in front of computer screens, a public commission led by BC Supreme Court Justice Austin Cullen has been examining evidence of that shadowy story and who knew about it. Do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Please state your full name and spell your first name and last name for the record. My full name is Ross Everett Alderson. It is a story first revealed to the public by this one-time cop turned casino investigator, who in the months before COVID came out of the shadows to W5 to detail an astonishing level of corruption underpinning and undermining the entire BC economy. Centered mostly at BC's largest casino that's next door to Vancouver Airport, the River Rock, owned by Great Canadian Gaming. What do you remember about day one on the job? Uh, shock. I'd heard stories about the volume of cash and things like that was coming through that place. But I think when you got there and, and you know, you're looking at uh, bags and bags of cash coming in on a daily basis, to me, uh, as a former police officer, I thought it was, um, you know, just sort of defied logic. And you saw that your very first day in the job? Yep. And what struck me was that there was a culture in the industry that this was the norm. How much money are you watching move through there? There were people coming in with you know, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, 200,000. I mean, there was a buy-in of half a million dollars in cash at one point. You don't have to take his word for it. This is casino surveillance footage at the cash cage as gamblers arrive with bags of cash. Shopping bags, duffel bags, and nearly all of it in $20 bills. Not bundled the way a bank would do it, but with rubber bands, the way drug dealers bundle their cash. What troubled me the most was that no one was prepared to ask where the money was coming from. The larger players were, were mainly, a lot of them from mainland China. It was their culture to use cash. That's what you were told. That's what I was told. Oh, I can hear you okay, Mr. McGill. Fast forward nearly three years after that interview, Alderson is a reluctant witness before Commissioner Cullen and Commission Counsel Patrick McGowan who says he had a hard time finding Alderson after he left Canada a few months after W5's initial report. I wasn't exactly hiding in a cave in Afghanistan. I was living in Australia, paying taxes, working with a driver's license. You would have the resources if I was really that necessary that you would easily find me. W5 reached Alderson in Australia's northeast coast, near where he testified from. He didn't want to be interviewed again telling us he stood behind what he told the commission. Alderson claimed he had to leave Canada because speaking out made it impossible for him to support and protect his family. It's one of the reasons I moved to Australia. Safety concerns for what reason? Well, uh, my family were placed on a police high response list at the end of 2015. Um, I mean, this is a inquiry into money laundering and, and, and some of the individuals involved are related to organized crime. The veiled threats haven't ended. Alderson provided the commission this anonymous email he received one week before he testified. Someone claiming to know him, urging him to think carefully about his testimony for the sake of his daughter in the future. She will know in her heart. And then it goes, please think of your daughter. Please tell the truth. What did you understand this to be telling you when you got this just a week ago? Tell, 
tell them what they want to hear. Think of my daughter. I, I mean, I don't know what, how to interpret it, quite frankly. I think the fact that they even mentioned my daughter is sickening. Alderson isn't the only one looking over his shoulder. Before identifying himself to W5, Alderson was an anonymous source for a BC newspaper reporter. Alderson leaked internal documents to him from his employer, the British Columbia Lottery Corporation, revealing what it knew about money laundering at casinos it licensed, particularly River Rock. Sam Cooper's reporting includes his best-selling book about dirty money called Willful Blindness. Have you been threatened? Let me put it this way. I've had my email spoofed by what looked like some, should be a pretty sophisticated actor. Uh, I've had my communications faked. It has impacted my life, but in, in a certain way, it's only hardened my resolve that this is very important. I do deeply believe this is important work for Canada's future. Was there something in the Cullen Commission testimony that surprised even you? I was surprised with the level of proof there can be no denying that uh, up to the minister's office level, the highest levels of the BC Lottery Corporation, the uh, regulator, GPEB, it was known from about 2009 or 2010 that this was massive uh, suspected drug cash laundering involving known high-level drug trafficking targets that were very connected to in the international drug trade using BC casinos. A lot of it's come out in this commission that they believe a lot of this um, activity was criminal. And they've even stated that they knew who the bad guys were and they wouldn't share any of this information with BCLC. They seem to focus on issues that were insignificant, in my opinion, compared to what was occurring in the casino. Right from when he first started working as a casino investigator, Ross Alderson was pushing to stop the bags of cash. As head of anti-money laundering for the BC Lottery Corporation, he urged police to investigate the source of that illegal money. And one name stood out, Paul Jin. What kind of information were you able to supply uh, police authorities that was helpful? Suspicious transaction reports were linked to individuals that were associated to him. He first sort of came on the radar around 2012. And uh, at that point, I believe he was banned as an undesirable around that time. So very early, once they were aware of him, right? Yep. In Richmond's Chinese community, Paul Jin had found notoriety for operating a massage parlor at this hotel. In this hidden camera exchange with CTV Vancouver, he offered sexual services to a would-be client. And that includes the hand release? Yeah, yeah. OK. According to court documents obtained by W5, in April 2015, the RCMP commenced an investigation into Paul Jin's alleged involvement in laundering proceeds of crime and loan sharking from an underground bank called Silver International. It was located inside this building, not far from the River Rock Casino. When I was told of the location, it didn't surprise me. It's very close location to the River Rock, and that sort of fitted the MO of what we'd seen with uh, deliveries and so forth. It was quickly apparent to police that Silver International was ground zero of money laundering in British Columbia. Just how much money can be seen on this video obtained by W5, taken from Silver International's own security cameras. It's closing time, but one staff member is waiting for a special customer. We've sped up the video a bit. The client brings in a suitcase, and then together, they unpack bundles of $20 bills. You're watching an underground bank deposit. Each bundle is $20,000. And by the time they're done, $1.4 million sits on the floor. And it'll remain there all night because there's nowhere else to put the cash. The safes under the desk are full. Those bags by the window are also full of cash. The floor was the only place left to stack it. This is only days before the RCMP raid Silver International. Just how much money was confirmed in the financial ledgers written in Chinese? A spreadsheet translated by RCMP officers tracked cash in and cash out. Day after day, hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. According to a police affidavit, more than $220 million a year 
drug money in, laundered money out. Police estimated that the total impact of that cash was $1.2 billion a year. And internal RCMP documents obtained by W5 reveal how it worked. Money from drug dealers was being deposited into Silver International. Some of that cash would be loaned to gamblers and to money exchanges, who would repay their debts to one of 600 Silver International bank accounts located in China. And from there, that money would be transferred to drug suppliers of fentanyl in China, cocaine in Peru and Mexico, and then those drugs shipped to Canadian drug dealers to start the entire cycle all over again. It even has a name, the Vancouver model. The commission heard all about the drug money laundering model and all those bundles of 20s moving through Silver International. But Paul Jin was never subpoenaed to testify. In September 2020, in what Richmond RCMP called a targeted attack, Jin was shot and a close associate killed at a Japanese restaurant. Both names were well known to Ross Alderson. These were people with criminal links, and I was getting information from police. And not only that, some very concerning links to the Chinese Communist Party. His testimony was that he was very concerned about the connections between these high-level gangsters, and in some cases, the Chinese Communist Party. His evidence is he knows for a fact that Chinese officials were involved in gambling in the casinos and receiving cash from these loan sharking networks. That wasn't tested in, in the inquiry, and to me, that was a disappointment. So while Paul Jin never testified, he was granted standing at the commission through his lawyer. And in one exchange dripping with irony, he accused Alderson of a criminal act, theft of documents, for sharing information with journalists. I understand you've given that testimony, but you took the law into your own hands, didn't you? Because I believe what was happening was so egregious. Yes, I did. Yes, but you took the law and into your own hands and broke it intentionally, didn't you? In this circumstance, I'm proud of what I did. I stand by it. And I know after W5, I think it was the city of Richmond, the city of Vancouver, one of the major unions, the Green Party, all were demanding a public inquiry and the bulk of the population of British Columbia were also demanding it. Coming up. So what's unlawful here? The person that exposed it or the people that allowed that to happen? Are the authorities looking the other way? The gangsters will have won, point blank. When W5 continues. October 15th, 2015. On the third floor of this building in Richmond, BC, is the office of Silver International. A security camera captures the exact moment heavily armed RCMP execute a search warrant in a case they call ePirate. It will become the biggest money laundering investigation in Canadian history. These evidence photos obtained by W5 reveal a secret illegal bank, one that's been supplying gamblers at BC casinos with bags of cash, millions of dollars. Behind the bulletproof glass are two safes loaded with $2 million, mostly in 20s. There are cash counting machines, suitcases and bags, computers and dozens of cell phones evidence seized at Silver International and from nine other locations. A bounty, W5 has learned, RCMP officers were eager to show the public. This is a never shared image of officers rehearsing a news conference where they would reveal the bust. And to drive home its magnitude, they displayed the more than $7.2 million seized during their raids. But then, W5 has learned, at the last minute, RCMP headquarters ordered the news conference cancelled. Once again, keeping how big BC's money laundering problem had become a secret. Thank you for waiting. The hearing is resumed. The Commission of Inquiry into Money Laundering in BC also heard testimony of high-ranking Liberal politicians in BC, 
ignoring warnings of the scope of criminality as far back as 2010. Rich Coleman was the cabinet minister responsible for gaming at the time. Mr. Pinnock suggests that you turned a blind eye to money laundering in casinos to avoid disrupting an important revenue stream for the government. That's just ridiculous. I, there was never ever that I saw in all the time I was government a point where somebody said, ignore a revenue stream that could be illegal for the benefit of government. That just did never happen. But in 2013, when Christy Clark was BC Premier, the betting limit on high rollers in those private VIP lounges at River Rock Casino was raised to $100,000 cash a hand. Were you aware that the media was reporting that millions of dollars in suspicious cash, predominantly $20 bills, was going through British Lower Mainland casinos? I don't remember that specifically in the coverage. Do you recall the coverage suggesting that there may be money laundering happening in British Columbia casinos? Yes. Okay. And do you recall the media providing examples of buy-ins in the hundreds of thousands of dollars in $20 bills? Maybe. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it would, I, I would have, I would have seen it if I'd been reading, if I'd been reading the stories, which I was, I just can't recall it specifically. And do you know whether there were any money laundering prosecutions in the province of British Columbia during your time as Premier? I don't think, I, you know, I don't know. Um, there may have been prosecutions. I don't know if there were any successful ones, though. Journalist Sam Cooper wrote many of those headline-grabbing stories that were hard to ignore during that time. The legal term is willful blindness. You're in a position of power where you are supposed to stop crime. You're given incredible evidence that crime is happening and you ignore it. Why? Revenue, hundreds of millions of dollars of profit per year flowing into BC government coffers. Brad West is the mayor of Port Coquitlam, east of Vancouver. He called for a commission of inquiry when W5 first interviewed him in 2019. We're getting a horrible reputation around the world as a place where you can come and wash dirty money. When we reconnected, Mayor West had watched some of the Cullen Commission and found it odd that no gamblers or suspected money launderers were subpoenaed as witnesses. Neither were key members of Great Canadian Gaming at the time. So by not calling for the heads of the company that owned the casinos where money laundering was going on, what questions do you think will never be answered? Well, I think we probably know the answer to it, which is why? Why did Great Canadian and others allow for this to ferment and to grow knowing that the money was coming from illegal sources? knowing that the money was coming after having killed thousands of British Columbians off of the poisoned opioid supply, and that money was being taken and, and washed clean. I mean, there's no way around it. That's blood money. That is money made off the deaths of thousands of British Columbians. Getting answers has been complicated by the resignation of Great Canadian CEO Rod Baker in January, after he and his wife jumped the queue for the COVID vaccine by flying to Yukon. Plus, the Canadian casino company was sold to a huge American private equity firm in September. Its co-founder resigned in March, after being linked to sex predator Jeffrey Epstein. So we don't yet know what the commission will recommend. But after months of testimony, if there are no recommendations of criminality, potentially arrests, if there are no individuals named who knew what was going on but did nothing, will the commission have failed the people of British Columbia? Well, I think it will be a real indictment on the status quo, I suppose, that powerful people, people in positions of power are protected. If there is no criminal accountability, that comes out of this. The message will be sent that British Columbia continues to be a place where you can come from around the world and engage in illegal activity and not face any consequences. And so I, I think the stakes are very high. So what about Ross Alderson? 
Well, there is some limited legal protection in Canada for public servants who report wrongdoing to authorities. The whistleblower laws in B.C. do not yet cover Crown corporations like B.C. L.C. And no whistleblower laws in Canada protect employees from leaking to the media. So when Alderson admitted to the commission that he provided reporter Sam Cooper those BCLC documents, he left himself vulnerable to legal penalty. The truth teller who helped expose massive money laundering in BC that led to a public inquiry is waiting to hear whether that same inquiry recommends he be punished for it. Did I leak information to the media? Yes, I did. Would I do it again? Yes, I would. So if Alderson faces some sort of charges for leaking those documents to you, what signal is that going to send to transnational crime groups? They won. First of all, common sense says that this is a, a, an inquiry about money laundering. It's not about how money laundering was exposed through reporting or Mr. Alderson talking to myself or you. And uh, the gangsters will have won, point blank. And people will be let off the hook. Do you think that there's anything that this inquiry has discovered that is going to be useful today, given that most of the transactions that it's investigating are at least five years old? Well, I, I think it could be. And the reason I say that is that uh, Commissioner Cullen has in front of him evidence not just of casino money laundering activity to do with these uh, bags, hockey bags of cash. He has evidence of the most powerful, I'm saying, and prolific transnational gang in the world active in BC's economy, you can fix the problem. But you have to be able to put these people at the top of these organizations in jail, and no one's going to jail. Justice Cullen must present his findings and recommendations to BC's Attorney General by December 15th.